All right. I'm going back to this to panel number seven. The next two jurors indicated to me that they could not impose death because of religious, personal, or moral reasons. So the, that's why I'm bringing them in now. Juror number 34, please. And this is also a juror who's not sure whether they were being paid or not. So I'm going to inquire as to that first. Welcome back. All right, I have a few questions for you. There aren't any right or wrong answers to the questions you're being asked. Um, the correct answer is the truth, because all we're trying to find out in asking you these questions is whether or not you could do your job as a juror in this type of case, something we need to know and you need to know. So just tell us the truth. But with you, I want to start with, you were supposed to check and see if you get paid for three weeks if you're a juror. Do you get paid? Yes. You do? Mm -hmm. All right. You're going to need to have that mic way closer to your yes, mouth. Yes, Okay. Um, so having asked you that, you also indicated to me that you have either a personal religious or moral objection to the death penalty. Is that correct? Yes. Which one is it? Uh, personal. It's what? Personal. It's personal. How long have you held that belief? Uh, all my life. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is this a, a belief, is your belief such that Faced with the, you know, choosing between life and death, would you ever be able to vote for a death penalty? No. Okay. State. Do you want to? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello. You would agree. It would not be fair on these kind of cases if everybody on the jury was an enthusiastic supporter of the death penalty, right? Yes. Same for the state. It wouldn't be fair if everybody on the jury was somewhat opposed to the death penalty, right? Right. And so in order to serve as a juror in this case, the law requires that you be able to give meaningful consideration to both possible penalties, life or the death penalty. Do you think you could do that? Can you repeat the question one more time? You're having a hard time staying awake. I'm a night shift nurse. I only had two hours of sleep, so I am doing my best. Okay. Yeah. How, when, what's your schedule? When do you have to work? Well, I worked this morning. Well, I worked the last night shift, and I got off this morning, so I only had two hours of sleep, and then I came here. Okay. And obviously, if you're selected and you're sequestered, you'll be sleeping non-nocturnal hours. Yeah. Or no, you'll be sleeping at night, is what I mean to say. Well... Yeah, it was kind of hard because I usually sleep through the day, work at night, so. I gotcha. Yes. So the question is, the law allows <clears throat> jurors to serve on a case where the death penalty is a possibility, even if that juror has conscientious objection, religious scruples opposed to the death penalty. What the law requires for you to serve is to be able to give meaningful consideration to both possible penalties for first-degree murder. Life in prison without the possibility of parole or the death penalty? Do you think you could do that? Yes. I have nothing further, Your Honor. All right, ma'am. Let me explain. Do you know what meaningful consideration to the death penalty means? Would you care to explain? Okay. So here's what you have to do as a juror. In order for the death penalty to even be a possibility in cases like this, you have to have found someone guilty of first-degree murder, meaning the intentional killing of another human being with no legal reason for having done it. It's not self-defense. It's not anything. And, it has to, and that finding is beyond a reasonable doubt. You with me so far? Yes. All right. Now you're in a penalty phase. The state's going to be presenting aggravators, which are reasons that they believe your vote should be for the death penalty. The defense is going to be presenting mitigators, which are reasons they believe your vote should be for life without the possibility of parole. Okay. If I lose you at any point, let me know. Or if you just need us to wake you up a little. Mm -hmm. so, all right. 
you have to be able to listen to the evidence both sides are presenting, the state and the defense, with an open mind. And you have to be open to both sentences. When you go back into the jury room, you weigh the mitigators and the aggravators fairly and openly. You're never required to vote for death, but you have to be able to at least consider it and be open to voting for death. So if you were back in that jury room after listening to all this evidence, you're weighing the aggravators, you're weighing the mitigators, you're deciding what's important to you and what's not important to you. And that process leads you to believe that the sentence should be life without the possibility of parole. Can you vote for that sentence? Yes. And if that process leads you to believe that the sentence should be death, can you vote for that sentence? No. Okay, thank you. State? State moves again. Defense? No objection. All right, ma'am, you're free to go. Thank you very much. Thank Get you. some sleep. Right. Um, that was 30, you're 265, right? Yeah. yeah. Just for a second, um, are uh, simultaneous uh, yeah, mine's gone. Yeah, mine's gone down too. Okay. We have we have a glitch in this thing. Is yours gone down? Yeah, mine froze. We got you set down. So sorry. All right, she's gonna restart, okay. and then the transcript will pop up for you. Okay. What's your All right. Everybody ready? Okay, I have a I have a note taking problem. I wrote down two jurors that told me that they could never consider death, and I wrote down 34 and 45. But I have 45 as already having been excused. That's correct, but he also said he couldn't vote death. Oh, is that what it is? So okay. All right, that concludes the cause portion of our questioning for this afternoon. So go back to panel number seven. Here's who I think is left. Juror in seat 33, 51, 53, and 56, and 60 from panel seven. Everybody on the same boat? Yep. That was a lot of jurors that got excused. So jurors in seat 33, please. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Is it Jean? Okay. Take this off so you can hear me. I have some questions for you, and then the attorneys will have some questions for you. There aren't any right or wrong answers to this. What we're tr the questions are designed to figure out for you and for us whether or not you can do your job as a juror in this type of case. So the only correct answer is the truth. It's what you actually truly think and feel. All right? Okay. So let me start with you've heard something about this case. Is that correct? Correct. Can you tell me what you've heard? I think... The, the basics, I don't follow news too closely, okay. but I'm aware of uh, the details of the, of the two murders. Um, the right. pre Tell me what you believe those details to be, based on what you've heard. <clears throat> uh, that Mr. Lloyd is being accused of uh, murdering his ex-girlfriend who was pregnant, and a <clears throat> police officer that was uh, trying to apprehend him. Okay. Anything else that you can remember? Uh, yes, he was kicked in the face and I believe lost vision in one eye. Okay. And did you have any information about who kicked him in the face? Yes, it was a police officer. Okay. Anything else you can remember about this case? No. How much coverage did you watch? Not much. I heard it on the uh, radio. Okay. Did you um, talk to anybody about it? You know, just water cooler talk at work or friends, family, anything like that? Uh, yeah, I'm sure I did. Do you remember any of those conversations? No, I wasn't in any detail. 
Okay. It was something that was on the news and on the radio constantly, so it's kind of unavoidable. So based on what you heard on the radio and any whatever you might remember, have you formed any opinion as to whether or not Mr. Lloyd is guilty? I mean, if we're being real, it's hard not to. Um, but I've been in management for 20 years, and uh, one of the valuable lessons that I've learned during that time is to try not to form an opinion to you hear all the facts on both sides. Right. Um, so, as difficult as that is sometimes. It can be difficult, and I understand that. So and remember what I told you, the only correct answer is the truth. In a criminal case, in any criminal case, the defendant is entitled to the jurors who, on, before they've heard any evidence, you have to be able to presume him to be innocent until and if the state proves he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you believe that you can do that in Mr. Lloyd's case? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I'm going to give you three scenarios, and you tell me if any of them apply to you, okay? The first one is, you're, it's the first day of the trial. You're waiting for the trial to start. You haven't heard anything. You're sitting in that box. Um, and what you're thinking is, all right, we're here to see if the state can prove this man is guilty of anything at the moment. I don't think he's guilty of anything. They have, I'm, I'm presuming he's innocent. Scenario number two I think this guy's probably guilty, but I'm willing to sit here and listen and see if the state can prove it to me. And scenario number three is, I think he's guilty, but I'm willing to listen and see if I'm wrong about that. Do any of those three apply to you? Yeah, like I said, scenario one, uh, being the management as long as I have, is difficult as something. It's, okay. It's something that I've uh, acquired over the years. Um, you didn't indicate any, any personal religious or, or moral objections to the death penalty, correct? No. Are you, as I told you, first degree murder in the state of Florida is, the inten is intentionally killing someone with no legal justification. It's not self-defense. It's you just killed someone and you intended to do it. Are you a person who believes that if you convict someone of first degree murder, you're going to vote for the death penalty, knowing nothing else, just that? It's first degree murder, I'm giving you death. I don't think there's a one size fits all or one scenario fits all. Um, okay. I believe in most cases that would probably be the immediate reaction, but you know, hearing the details of the case specifically would, uh, would be needed. Sorry, I'm trying to ask questions and keep notes at the same time. So let me add to that factual scenario. Someone's been convicted of first degree murder. Again, the standard's beyond a reasonable doubt. And the person is a law enforcement officer. Does that change your answer in any way? No. Um, I believe every life is just as equal as every other. So I don't think there should be a more severe or less severe penalty based on someone's position. Right. <laughs> so let me add one more fact to that, which is the person that's been convicted of first degree murder was previously convicted of another murder. Does that change your answer in any way? You haven't heard anything else, just that. Conviction of first degree murder, previous conviction for murder. Sure. Okay, how does it change your answer? It would, I guess, lean me in the direction that they were more than likely guilty. Uh, no, I'm not talking about guilt, okay? Because in order, I'm talking about death penalty. Does it lean you towards death penalty? saying, look, if, if I find you guilty of first-degree murder and you've been convicted before of a murder, I'm not really interested in what else you have to say. I'm voting for death. I would definitely hear the case out. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't be a definitive. All right. So you heard me describe the process. Number one, you don't even get to a penalty phase unless someone is convicted of first-degree murder. So the jury's already decided someone's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of intentionally killing someone else. You with me so far? Yes. Then there's a penalty phase in certain cases, like this one, where the, the state is going to put on evidence of what are called aggravating factors, the reasons they believe your vote should be for death. The defense is going to put on evidence of mitigating factors. And again, this is at the penalty phase. Person's already been found guilty. They're going to put on evidence of mitigating factors, reasons they believe that the vote should be life without the possibility of parole. To sit as a juror in these types of cases, you must be able to listen to both sides with an open mind, meaning 
you can't be sitting there sit, listening and going, okay, I'll listen to you, and then I'm going to vote the way I was going to vote anyway. It has to be, I'm willing to listen to all this information and process it. Go back in that jury room and weigh those aggravators, weigh those mitigators, figure out what I think is important and what's not important. Number one, can you go through that process with an open mind? Yes. All right. Re and can you do that regardless of the fact that you've convicted someone of first-degree murder? Yes. And then if that process leads you to believe that the appropriate sentence is life without parole, can you vote for that? And if that process leads you to believe the appropriate sentence is death, can you vote for that? Yes. All right. Mr. Lloyd has raised the insanity defense, as I told you. This is in the guilt phase. They have, when you're trying to decide whether he's guilty or not, the defense has to prove it by clear and convincing evidence. So it's the end of the guilt phase. You've heard all the state's evidence. You've heard the defense's evidence as to whether or not he committed these crimes. You are convinced by the defense's evidence that he was insane at the time this occurred. Can you return a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity? If, they, if I believe that they proved their case, yes. Okay. And then my last question to you is, before I turn this over to the lawyers, the, the conviction for the murder of Miss Dixon and the unborn child, you can't use that to determine whether or not he's guilty. It's two separate cases. Can you put that out of your mind during the guilt phase? Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions for you, Mr. Buxman. You may inquire. Can we approach, Your Honor? Yes. All right, sir, we appreciate your being here today. You have some information about this case that is not admissible, so for that reason, I'm going to release you as a juror, okay? okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Have a good day. We appreciate your service. That was juror number 33. Next up, I have panel 7, juror 51, that. correct? Yes, juror 51. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. How are you? I'm well, thank you. All right. Try to relax. I know this is not the most comfortable of situations, but I have some questions for you, and then the attorneys are going to have some questions for you. There aren't any right or wrong answers to this. I'm sorry. I'm taking notes at the same time that I'm asking questions, so please excuse me. There aren't any right or wrong answers to this, to any of these questions. The point of the questions is for us and you to determine whether or not you can do your job as a juror in this case. That's why we're asking them, okay? So the only correct answer is the truth. You need to be honest with us and open about your opinions, your thoughts, your beliefs. Let me start with, you indicated that you have never heard about this case prior to coming here. Is that correct? All right. Um, do you have a position on the death penalty? Not in particular. I, it's, it's a form of punishment, I guess. Or I don't have an opinion. Okay. Are you someone who believes that the death penalty should never be imposed in a case? Um, no. If it should be imposed for certain criminals or people in that nature like terrorists. Okay. So let me go over these types of cases and what the law is in the state of Florida in okay. a little bit more detail than what I gave you earlier. Number one, you can't even talk about the death penalty unless a jury convicts someone of first-degree murder. There's a guilt phase. At the end of that guilt phase, the jury votes guilty of first-degree murder, which means someone intentionally killed another person and they had no legal reason to do so. It's not self-defense. It's not, it's not anything. It's, you just killed someone, all right? You with me so far? Yes, ma'am. And the jury has to have found that person guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. 
Yes, ma'am. Now you can have a conversation in certain cases about whether or not death is an appropriate sentence. There is no automatic sentence for death in Florida. So that second phase where you're going to have the conversation about whether this person who's been convicted of first degree murder should be sentenced to life or death is called the penalty phase. In the penalty phase, in order to sit in a case like this, you have to be able to listen with an open mind to the state's aggravators, the reasons they believe death is the appropriate sentence, and the defense's mitigators, the reasons they believe life without parole is the appropriate sentence. You with me so far? Yes, ma'am. All right. So as you sit here today, having heard nothing other than a person has been convicted of first-degree murder, are you someone who would automatically vote for death? No. All right. If I added to that the fact that the person who was killed was a law enforcement officer, would that change your answer? No. If I added to that the fact that the defendant had a prior conviction for murder, would that change your answer? No, it would not. No. All right. Back to the penalty phase. You're in a penalty phase. You're sitting in the jury box. Can you listen with an open mind both to the aggravators and the mitigators? And by open mind, I mean not you're sitting there thinking, okay, I'll listen to you, and then I'm going to vote the way I was going to vote anyway. It means you can listen to it, you can absorb the information, and think about it and consider it. Can you do that? Yes, ma'am, because that's the only way you should be able to do it. You have to be able to take everything into consideration. All right, perfect. So you can go through the process of weighing aggravators and mitigators. Yes, ma'am. If that process led you to believe death, or death was the appropriate sentence, could you impose that? No, I would not impose it. But if, it, if, it, if all the evidence and everything led to that conclusion and they met everything that was required by law, yes, I can say well, I can impose that, that sentence. You could vote for a death penalty? Yes. All right. And if it all led you to believe that life without parole was the appropriate sentence, could you vote for that sentence? Yes, I can. Do you have any doubts about either one of those? No. All right, moving on to the insanity defense. The insanity defense is raised in the guilt portion. When you're trying to decide whether to find someone guilty or not guilty of what they're charged with, the defense has to raise it and they have to prove it, not the state. It's the only time the defense has to prove something in the guilt phase. So it's the end of the guilt phase. You've heard all the state's evidence. You've heard all the defense's evidence. And the defense has convinced you that he was insane at the time this occurred. Could you return a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity? Yes, I can. And lastly, can you put aside, I told you about the conviction about Ms. Dixon and her unborn child. She's pregnant at the time. Yeah. Can you put that out of your mind when you're trying to decide whether or not he's guilty? Yes, I can. All right. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions for you. Mr. Boxman, you may inquire. The lawyers are going to talk to you now. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I want to start with a couple questions about the insanity defense. That's something that would happen in the guilt phase of this trial, whether or not the, 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 the part of the trial that was designed that the defendant committed these crimes. Okay. Because the insanity defense brings with it issues of mental health, I have a couple questions about, first, is whether you or a close friend or family member have any experience with mental health issues. Not that I'm aware of from like, like, talking with my parents, but not that I'm aware of. No close friends or anything like that? No. Some people in society feel that mental health issues are just made up. And it, like that. Do you? Okay. Based on that answer, I'm assuming that you would be able to listen to all of the evidence regarding the mental health issue, determine if a mental health issue exists in this case and what ramifications are, and keep an open mind as far as whether it's sanity. Yes. Shifting gears, moving ahead. Of these questions, the jury has already determined that the defendant was guilty of first degree murder in this case. The jury has already rejected and found the insanity defense wasn't proven and wasn't a viable defense. Now we're moving to the penalty phase. In that, 
part of the process, your job, job as a juror would be to analyze the aggravating factors and mitigating circumstances in the penalty phase. Now, when you were first started talking with the judge, she asked you about your feelings of the death penalty, and you kind of said you really didn't have an opinion one way or the other. Right? Yeah. Okay. And I think you made a statement that the death penalty is appropriate for certain types of criminals like terrorists, I think you said. Yes. Talk to me a little, a little more on that. What do you uh, talk about? Like, I was ex military, so I spent time overseas, and just the way their belief is that they're just, you can't change that mindset. Knowing that, seeing them and how they lived and how they, they wanted everybody to adhere to theirs, that to me, they, and they also changed the way the society in general lives, that you can't have that. And then, to me, that's not good. Okay, I think I understand. Thank you for your service. Hmm? So am I, if, if I'm correct in what you're saying, I'm not telling you. The, the mindset and the belief system of these types of terrorists that you dealt with overseas are such that they, the death penalty would be appropriate because you can't change their belief system. Yeah. Yes. Can you envision a set of circumstances where the death penalty would be appropriate for someone not that type of terrorist, that that type of person with those horrible mm, Not without any facts or seeing any evidence of that prior to making that decision. Okay. Let me ask it in a slightly different way. Um, if you were selected for this jury and you heard all the evidence of the aggravating factors, you heard all the evidence of the mitigating factors, and you are back in the jury room, Hypothetical situation where you're talking about your friends and family and about the yeah, I could put that person to death. We're talking about a real life situation. <laughs> if you felt that after weighing the aggravating factors and the mitigating circumstances that the death penalty was a proper sentence in this case, not for an overseas terrorist, but for an American citizen, would you be able to raise your hand in that room and say, Yes, I think the death penalty is appropriate? And that Yes, I can do that. Weighing all of the evidence and the circumstances and seeing everything, because if I'm sitting back and I'm probably going to be sitting out here for the first part, so I would be more inclined to say yes. Okay. And the, the, purpose, the purpose of my questions was, were, were you were you of the mentality that if it was a terror situation, I could do it, but absent that, I could not. I just clarified that. Yeah. Thank you. Once this is not, it, it, once we get into a penalty phase, that is when you will hear evidence of the details and the circumstances surrounding these aggravating factors and mitigating circumstances. Now is not the time to discuss those things. But if you hear a variety of aggravating factors presented by the state, and that those are factors that make this murder more egregious than other murders, and those aggravating factors, the more and more you really bad and they're egregious and you're, the pendulum starts swinging over towards death in your mind. No matter how far that pendulum got to death, you'd be able to hold off a final judgment until you hear evidence of the mitigating circumstances. Yes. Okay. Regardless of what those mitigating circumstances are, could you listen to them, melt them over in your mind, consider them, and only then decide to give them any weight if they deserve it, and then make the Yes, yes, I can do that. So you can keep an open mind. Yep. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Would you be able to give meaningful consideration or truly consider any piece of mitigation evidence that is presented to you, regardless of if at first blush you may be thinking it really isn't important in my mind? Hold off judgment until you hear the details surrounding it. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. No other questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Miller, you may call.
Hello. Hello. When Mr. Buxman asked you about if you would be able to world vote for a death sentence for someone, you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if you were sitting out here for the first part, you'd be more inclined to say yes. Do you remember saying that? Yes. Okay. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. The first part of the trial is where the jury would determine if the state has proven Mr. Lloyd guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Or if the defense can prove by clear and convincing evidence he's not guilty by reason of insanity, okay? So if we're in the second part of this trial, you as a juror, if you're selected, would have already decided that Mr. Lloyd is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the intentional premeditated killing of an innocent victim. With me? Yes, ma'am. And in making that determination, you would have considered any defenses. In this case, you know we've pled not guilty by reason of insanity, but talking about more of a hypothetical case, if a jury finds a defendant guilty of first-degree murder, that jury would have considered any defenses available, like self-defense, for example, in finding that person guilty of intentional premeditated murder. With me? Yes, ma'am. That defendant thought about it, meant to do it, and did it. No question. Got it? Yep. Is death the only appropriate penalty for that person who's guilty of that crime? No. Why not? It, it, the evidence would have to keep you in that realm. You say, you know, it was just, to, just to say, okay, because he, he was guilty of the crimes, is it right to something for him to death? I can't say yes or no because. Did they, did you, did, was it met? Were the circumstances all met? Like the mitigating factors, there might have been something that I believe that you know, seen or heard that led me to say you can't sentence to death. Okay. I just want to make sure that thing that we're talking about that you might have seen or heard isn't really us talking about him being not guilty. Does that make sense? Yes. There's no doubt about his guilt in determining life or death. So the scenario that you're talking about or the circumstances aren't things, or are they things, that have to do with whether he's guilty or not. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, knowing that the innocent victim is a law enforcement officer, yes. does that change your opinion or make death the only appropriate penalty? No, it doesn't change my decision. It doesn't change my decision. I don't my decision would be based on the evidence and the testimony and the, and the other factors of the case and the sentencing portion of it, too. Okay. Well, and let me tell you this. In Florida, right, so the judge told you if we're in the second part of this trial, the state has to prove the existence of at least one aggravating factor beyond a reasonable doubt right. for the defendant to be even eligible for the death penalty. Right. Okay? Killing a law enforcement officer is an aggravating factor in Florida. Okay, and so some people say to me, listen, if I'm being honest about my feelings on this, if you kill a cop, death is the only appropriate penalty for you. Does that make sense? Yes. Tell me what your thoughts are. And, and, and just because you kill a cop, there's still more to that story. I, I would still believe there's still more to that story. Just because the state proved that he wouldn't defend it when the guilty party killed the cop, there's still other mitigating circumstances that could lead me to believe that death isn't the only sentence. Okay. When you say there's more to that story, could you elaborate a little bit for me, please? Um, yeah. I mean, there's always more to, there's more to the story than just, okay, this is what everybody knows. It's the optics. I would call it optics. I'm guessing, I don't even know how to explain it, but my news is that there's always two sides to every story. They're showing me one that just because he killed the cop doesn't mean, and the law enforcement officer doesn't mean that he needs to be put to death. He, it may have been something that I saw that maybe somebody else didn't see to say, hey, okay, let's not sentence him to death, but he can go and live without his days. Okay, and sure, and I think you actually touched on a really interesting thing, because mitigation, right, the state talked about how they prove aggravators and the defense can prove mitigation. Mitigation can come from anything. It can even come from the state's case. 
right? So you may see something in the case, the state's case in chief, that you think, I find that to be mitigated. It's not limited to just what evidence the defense puts on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, sort of the same questions, knowing that the defendant has been previously convicted of another murder. But, but should he, if he doesn't be tried and convicted for that, that should not weigh on this. <laughs> it's a terrible microphone. Yeah, not um, but that shouldn't weigh, that will have no weight on this because it's, this case he's in trial for, not that one, because that comes back to the double jeopardy. And as a juror, I can't do that to anybody. I hear you. And that's exactly right. Again, I want to be in the first part of this trial where we're deciding if the state's proven him guilty, whether or not he's guilty of some other crime has nothing to do with this. <laughs> totally agree with you. In the second part, if we get there and we're talking about life or death, again, it's an aggravating factor in Florida that the defendant has been previously convicted of murder, right? <laughs> and so some people say to me, if I know he's already guilty of murder and he's doing life, then really for this murder, death is the only appropriate penalty. Make sense? Yes. Do you feel similarly? Mm, okay. Just because the, because of the mitigation factors, too. But, okay, if he's already serving life, that's okay. Why would this put him to death because he killed somebody with a badge? I can't do that. Okay. Um, Just because he was convicted of a different crime. That to me, that crime, he's already been tried and convicted. That it's not going to really anything on my decision for this trial. I hear you. Uh, and in those circumstances that we talked about, murder of a cop, already been convicted of another murder, do you think you could meaningfully consider the defendant experiencing the effects of racism? Yes. Like in a way that I hear it, I internalize it, and it may actually have impact on what I'm going to do as far as life or death. Yes. Okay. Death is never required, not in any case, not in the worst imaginable case you can conceive of. With me? And so the second part of this trial, the judge is gonna give a lot of instructions. If we get there, you're selected. State has to prove the existence of one aggravating factor beyond a reasonable doubt. The aggravator is sufficient to warrant the death penalty, that the aggravation outweighs the mitigation. And then the last question is still, do you believe death is the appropriate penalty? And the answer is never required to be yes to that last question. Even if it's yes, 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 you can say no at the end. With me? Yes. If one juror votes for life, then the verdict will be life. OK with that? Yep. We talk a lot about mitigation. Mitigation can be anything to anyone. And it simply means why one juror would choose life or not choose death. It doesn't have to be unanimous. It can be unique. It can be even something seemingly small, like a smile observed between the defendant and a family member. For that juror, that juror says, I observed that, I assign it the weight of life, I'm not imposing a death sentence in this case. Make yeah. sense? Yes, ma'am. For a just verdict to be returned, all 12 jurors' individual moral assessments about whether Mr. Lloyd lives or dies have to be heard in this courtroom. Got it? Yes, ma'am. It's your duty, your right, and your responsibility. And it would not be a just verdict. We call it a miscarriage of justice if a juror's individual moral assessment wasn't reflected on the verdict form read in this courtroom. Yes, Makes sense? Sir. Sometimes deliberation can get contentious. People have strong opinions, differing opinions, right? Yep. You're certainly not going to let anybody bully or badger you into changing your opinion if you've already reached your individual moral assessment. Yes. Right? And you wouldn't bully or badger anybody else. If you have reached a verdict and it is for life and it's not being respected by your fellow jurors, you can say, we're done here. I've reached a verdict. Deputy, please get the judge. We can go home. Yes. Okay. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. Follow-up question. Yeah, that's fine. Can I just ask you when you when you were talking about terrorism or a terrorist, what is your definition of a terrorist, please? Somebody who can change society in the way people live day to day. And, uh, and for an ideological belief in a system that just it changes the way everybody in the country and the world has to live. 
And I, I think what I'm afraid of, I just want to make sure, because some people could perceive killing a cop. I need to approach. No, you're All right, sir. Um, <clears throat> we're going to send you through to the final round of questioning in this case, and it is the final round. We'll be picking the jury from that group. So several things are about to happen. Number one, you're now a purple dot, no longer a yellow dot. Remember, I told you we call jurors in by colors. Mm -hmm. I need to change your dot to purple. That's the final group. We're going to give you a, and the deputies are going to put that on your badge so you can remember. We're going to give you a, uh, a package. It includes a slip of paper with the phone number that you need to call to find out when you're supposed to return. I don't know the exact date because I don't have enough jurors to call the purple group back. Honestly, I don't think it's going to be this week. I think it's going to be next week. But just to be safe, start calling tomorrow night. There'll be a recorded message eventually. There may be no okay. recorded message saying anything about purple. That means you don't have to come back. Until you hear purple come back, this is your date, then you come back. Okay. That day, because we're picking the jury that day, we are sequestering the jury that day. So you need to bring with you your suitcase, packed and ready to go in case you're selected. Leave it in your car. You don't need to bring it into the courthouse. If you get picked, arrangements will be made for you to get it. Um, and lastly, we're giving you, oh, the sequestration package explains more about being sequestered. And it gives you a list of suggestions for what you should bring with you to, to being sequestered. And lastly, we have a uh, letter in there for your employer to let them know that you're coming back. Do you have any questions? No, I'm not. All right. Thank you, sir. You have a good afternoon. We'll see you next time. All right, juror in seat 53, please. Good afternoon, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. So I have some questions for you, and then the lawyers are going to have a few questions for you. There aren't any right or wrong answers to these questions. The reason you're being asked them is so that you can determine and we can determine whether or not you can do your job as a juror in this type of case. Follow the law, put aside your personal feelings, that sort of thing. So the only correct answer is the truth. Don't worry about what your answer is. Just tell us the truth, OK? Let me start with, you've heard something about this case, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Can you tell me what you've heard? Uh, yeah, I work for a uh, statewide political organization, so I follow the media very closely and was actually in working in the legislature at the time. So the hoopla that came from the local politicians, I heard from about all of that. You can be a lot more detailed than oh. what you just were. You can be blunt about it. Sure. What is the hoopla that occurred at the sure. legislature? So I worked in the state legislature for the senator that represents this area during the time. So she made public statements about it and that stuff. And then subsequently, I worked in local government. So any of the memorial type things, I attended. So you also attend memorials for fallen officers? Mm -hmm. uh, is that a yes? Yes, yes. Did you attend any of the memorials for Lieutenant Clayton? Yes. All right. And did you do that as part of your job, or as did a you do it for personal job. reasons, or both? Uh, both. OK. Um, were you part of the discussions in the legislature 
and the actions taken by the governor's office involving the state attorney that was removed from the death penalty cases here? I don't believe so, but I did interview for a role in the state attorney's office when she was the state attorney. Okay. Um, and you said you're a consumer. I, I see what your job is. So you're a consumer of media. Yes. Did you follow the story closely? Um, probably not as closely as a lot of people, but I dailies got them for every major newspaper in the state. And did you do this since it happened until now when yes. I told you to stop? But yes. Okay. Did you also talk to folks about it, not only at work, but friends and family? Um, I don't think I talked about it much at work other than okay. <laughs> any talking points or anything I had to write in regards to it, but personally, I probably didn't talk much about it. All right. So tell me what you remember about when this happened. Well, I remember it happening. Okay. Uh, gun violence advocate. I remember having to pull out the good old, you know, we need to change guns in this country stuff. And then I remember trying just to keep tabs on it if we need to make further statements. But that's right. probably about it. Based on everything that you were involved in, because you apparently had quite a bit of involvement, did you form an opinion as to whether or not Mr. Lloyd is guilty? Uh, yes. And what is that opinion? Yes. Yes, he's guilty? Yes, I do believe okay. so. Jurors have to be able to presume that Mr. Lloyd is innocent until and if the state can prove he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Can you do that, or would you start this trial thinking, yeah, I think this guy's guilty? Uh, I probably would. I think I could get there, but it probably would take some work mentally to unthink of that opinion. So you'd start out thinking he's guilty? Yes, yes. And hope that the information in the case swayed you one way or another? Yes. Okay, thank you. State? State moves. Defense. All right. This probably isn't the case for you. It would be very hard for you to forget <laughs> all of that. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. You're excused. Oh, I'm sorry. Juror in seat number 56, please. That's it. Yeah. All right. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Yourself? I'm doing well. All right. So I have some questions for you, and then the attorneys may have some questions for you. There aren't any right or wrong answers to this. You just need to tell me the truth. Okay. Um, the point of the questions is to figure out, for you and for us, whether or not you can do your job as a juror in these cases. So the only correct answer is the truth. Okay. Um, let me start by asking you a couple of basic questions. You said you've heard about this case. Is that correct? That's correct. How much have you heard? Uh, a lot. Okay. Yeah. Did you follow it pretty closely? No, not at all. Okay, so when you say a lot... It just whatever came on the news at night. Okay. Yeah. Was this back when it first happened or, you know, throughout the years? What are we talking? This is when it first happened. Yeah, I haven't heard anything recently. I don't watch the news. Okay. So back when it first happened, were you also, I mean, were folks talking about it at work? Friends were talking about it? Anything like that? Not really. No? All right. Did you form an opinion as to whether or not Mr. Lloyd was guilty at that time? No, no. Okay. Um, tell me what you remember seeing on the news in as much detail as possible. I remember hearing about uh, a case of a gentleman um, killing his spouse and a kid was involved or something like that. Um, that's pretty much all. Anything else? No. Do you remember seeing any video of anything else? No, ma'am. Okay. Do you remember um, anything about this case, about Lieutenant Clayton? No. No? No. You just remember the, the other case? Exactly. The Dixon one that I told you about? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you think you could put that out of your mind and focus on this case alone? Yeah. I mean, 
I've, I've never did this. I'm a very emotional person. Um, so anything that I do get involved with is going to be emotional for me. Simple. Um, but again, it's all about the facts, not how you feel. Correct? Correct. Um, your verdict and the verdict of the jury must be based on the evidence, as I told you, that you hear in this courtroom. And the state has to prove Mr. Lloyd guilty in the guilt phase. They have to prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense has raised the defense of insanity, which they have to prove by clear and convincing evidence. The defense has to prove it. Okay. So since I brought that up, let me ask you a question. If at the end of the guilt phase, when you're trying to decide whether he's guilty or not, the defense had convinced you he was insane at the time, would you be able to return a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity? Yeah, if everything points to that correctly, absolutely. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the death penalty. Do you have a position on the death penalty? I do not. All right. Are you someone who has a moral, religious, or personal objection to death? No, ma'am. Are you someone who believes... First, let me tell you, first-degree murder, as I told you, it's intentionally killing someone. Mm -hmm. You don't have any legal reason to do it. They're, they're not attacking you. It's not self-defense. You just intentionally killed them, All right? Um, in order to even discuss death or life, the jury has to have found someone guilty of first-degree murder beyond a reasonable doubt. You with me so far? I am. Okay. Now you're in the penalty phase. You have to decide between life and death. But sitting here right now, without having heard anything else, are you someone who's thinking, if I convict someone of first-degree murder, I'm giving them the death penalty? No. All right. Are you someone who is thinking, there is no way I'm ever sentencing anyone to death? No. Okay. If I add to the fact that the person who died was a law enforcement officer, does that change your answer in any way? No. And if I add to the fact that the person was previously convicted of murder... Remember, I told you he's been convicted of murdering Ms. Dixon and her unborn child. Does that change your answer in any way? No. All right, you heard me describe what the process is like in the penalty phase. That's State correct. puts on aggravators, defense puts on mitigators. You have to be able to listen to both sides. You've got to listen till the end. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not saying you have to believe or disbelieve anything, but you have to be willing to listen to it with an open mind. You can't be sitting there thinking, okay, I'll listen to you, and then I'm going to vote the way I was going to vote anyway. You have to listen, process all of this, go back in the jury room, weigh those aggravators and mitigators. Can you go through that process with an open mind? Yes, I could go through that process without being biased. All right, and after you're done with that process, if you thought the appropriate sentence was life without parole, can you vote for that? Yes, yes I can. And if you thought it was death, can you vote for that? I can as well. All right, and I think my last question to you is, can you put the um, conviction for murder of Miss Dixon and her unborn child aside during the guilt phase. It can be considered in penalty, but not in guilt. Can you put it aside? Yes. In yes. other words, you can't convict him in this case because he was convicted in the other one. Can you follow that rule? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions for you, but I believe this, the attorneys do. Mr. Boxman, you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. How are you doing, boss? Pretty good. You? I'm very well. That's an issue that's going to be dealt with in the first part of the trial, the guilt phase of the trial. The trial part of the trial is going to determine if Mr. Lloyd committed the crimes he's charged with. Okay. Because insanity involves some issues surrounding mental health, I've got a few personal questions for you. I don't mean to pry, but I've got to ask a couple. Sounds good. Do you or a close friend or a family member have any experience or involvement with mental health issues? Uh, yes, my wife's sister actually has a, um, not ADHD, autism. Okay. So, based on that, you've obviously been around that individual with autism, right? That's correct. Uh, so, you, I'm assuming that you believe that mental health issues are, in fact, real. Yes, they okay. are. Some people in society don't think they're real, but you don't describe it. Okay. Would you be able to listen to all the evidence surrounding? the insanity defense, for instance, evidence that a mental health issue may be involved in this case. And if it is involved, what the ramifications of that issue are before you make a final decision as far as whether insanity is proven. 
If it's presented, yes. Okay. You can keep an open mind and listen to all the evidence before you decide. Absolutely. Okay. Shifting gears to the penalty phase of this case. If the jury finds the defendant guilty of first degree murder in the guilt phase, you found it beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury has therefore rejected the insanity defense and found that he that wasn't applicable in this case. We then would move into what's called the penalty phase, the okay. sentencing portion. In that portion, presented what the proper punishment should be, life or death, okay? Now, this is not the time to discuss the details and the specific pieces of evidence that would, you would make here about the aggravating factors and the mitigating circumstances. That's for the time. Okay. The questions that I'm going to be really focusing on are your ability to keep an open mind and listen to everything before you make the final decision. So if you were in the penalty phase, the jury's already found him guilty, mm -hmm. and now we're talking about punishment. The judge talked to you earlier about the fact that the victim in this case was a law enforcement officer. Now, if that is proven to you, that in by Florida law is an aggravating factor that you can consider in determining the proper punishment. Make sense? Yes, it does. The judge also mentioned the prior murder that the defendant was convicted of of his girlfriend, his friend and girlfriend. Mm -hmm. That can't be used to determine if he's guilty of the crimes in the first part, but it can be used if you felt it was proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt as an aggravator of the punishment portion. Okay. So let's say that the aggravating factors of the victim was a law enforcement officer were proven to you, and the aggravating factor that he had a prior murder was proven to you, and these aggravating factors are starting to move your pendulum over towards, I think, death is the and the aggravating factor is that all the evidence you hear is really bad. Mm -hmm. and it's leaning towards the death penalty. The question I have is, before you make a final decision on what the proper punishment to be, can you truly listen to and consider all the mitigating evidence, the evidence about the defendant's background, his character, his life that's provided by the defense, to see if that may bring your pendulum back towards life? Before you make a decision? Absolutely. Okay. And can you do that? Regardless of what mitigating evidence is presented to you, regardless of what is brought to you, for instance, say the defendant brings out that, uh, say the defendant was suffering the effects of racism at At first blush, you may think, I don't know if that's really mitigating, but can you hold off judgment until you hear all the details and the, the evidence that deal with that before you make a decision? Can you do that? Any potential piece of evidence that's brought to you? Yes, I can. All right. So if I were to ask you about a hundred different possible mitigating uh, pieces of evidence, which your answer would always be, I would listen to it, I would think about it, I would process the evidence, and only then would I make it. So everything will be considered. Right. And after considering all of the aggravating factors and mitigating evidence, you decide what evidence has what of well, those factors have been proven to you? And if they have been proven to you, you decide what importance or what weight to give that evidence. You can give it a little weight. You can say, eh, it's proven, but it's really not important in my big decision. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, this piece of evidence is really important to me. You decide that weight. Okay. Make sense? Yes, it does. If after you go through that process, you feel in your heart that the death penalty is the proper punishment, would you be able to raise your hand? walk in here and say the defendant deserves the death penalty for what he did. Yes, sir. Likewise, if you ever going through that whole process, you felt that life in prison was the proper punishment. Did you vote that way as well? Of course. Is there anything in your background, your life, or your belief system that you think we should know about considering we're trying to find jurors that can be completely fair and completely impartial in this type of a case? Meaning? Um, if I was watching Monday Night and I look out the window and someone's driving away from my car, and I'm asked to come and sit in the Grand Theft Auto case, okay. I'm probably not going to be the most fair guy in the world. Okay, understood. understood. Maybe, so that's something in my background, my experience, that may make me a, a not a good juror for that case. Gotcha. And there may not be, I'm just, I'm just asking. Well, growing up, no, I've, I have been arrested, um, not for any felonies or anything of the sort, but, I mean, I don't have any bias towards anybody or anything. 
You know, it's either you present the evidence, if it's a fact, and then you follow by it. Um, I, I, I don't judge people. <laughs> uh, were you treated fairly by the police and the system in that prior issue? Not all the time, I mean, but. Would that affect your decision here at all? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Everybody's different, you know? You just got to present what's available, take it into consideration, and then make your decision. All right. Thank you, sir. No problem. Any questions, Your Honor? Thank you, Mr. Buxley. Ms. Miller, may I inquire? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Just a couple follow-up questions. Okay. And so something you said resonated with me, where you were like, it's about the facts, not my feelings. Right, do you remember saying that? Yes, ma'am. So if we're in the second part of this trial, right, it's like a big trial broken up into two kind of mini trials. The first part is, can the state prove Mr. Lloyd guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of these crimes? With me? Yep. Or can we prove him not guilty by reason of insanity? Okay. Okay. Only if he's found guilty of murder in the first degree do we go to the second part of this trial, right, where then you as a juror would be asked to decide life or death. Correct. Okay. The steps of how we get to even considering the death penalty at the end of this second part, has the state proven the existence of at least one aggravating factor? Okay. Is, does that aggravate, is that aggravator sufficient to warrant the death penalty? Does the aggravation outweigh the mitigation? And the last question is, is death the appropriate penalty? Mm -hmm. And the answer is never required to be yes. Death is never required in any case, mm -hmm. right? So you could say yes, 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 and still vote no. Mm -hmm. And there is no right or wrong answer. You have to apply the facts and the law as the judge gives it and vote with your conscience. Exactly. And so it's kind of a hybrid of hearing the facts, knowing the law, but still your feelings and your conscience come into play. Does that make sense? I understand. Okay. And so I want to back up just a little bit. When we talk about somebody who's found guilty of first-degree murder, murder in Florida, first-degree murder, is the intentional premeditated killing of an innocent victim. That defendant thought about it, he meant to do it, and he did it. For you, is the death penalty the only appropriate penalty for somebody who commits that crime? No. Why not? I mean, because there is, to be there's not enough behind. Um, I, I don't even know how to put it. Without hearing somebody's statement of what was going on in their mind during that time, what ended up happening, what was the situation, what I, I can't really answer that question, you know, because at the end of the day, again, like I said before, it all depends on, it all depends on the subsequential facts, basically. Okay. I just, I need to know what happened and what was the situation and what was going on in that person's head before I can undeniably say that person deserves death. Okay, and I just want to clarify, I hear you, I get it. I just want to clarify one thing. So insanity, right, is a high, well, it's a mental state. Mm -hmm. The defendant couldn't, choose between right and wrong, basically. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and oversimplifying. I got gotcha. you. And so if you find somebody guilty to decide life or death, you would have ruled out not guilty by reason of insanity. Okay? Okay. It doesn't mean that there's not other things going on. You just didn't think there was a defense to the crime. Does that make sense? That does like, make sense. Not guilty by reason of insanity means not guilty. There could be other mental health issues or other things going on. Could you still consider those things even if it didn't rise to meeting that definition of insanity? Does that make sense? I, you kind of lost me. Okay. So what's going on in a person's head is certainly relevant. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the first part of this trial, if you're selected as a juror, you would be tasked with deciding if the state's proven Mr. Lloyd guilty, right? Correct. And also if we've proven him not guilty by reason of insanity. Correct. And even though not guilty by reason of insanity is saying, I did it, 
but I was insane, it's still not guilty. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I get what you're saying. So if, if he's not guilty by reason of insanity, we don't even get to the second part where you decide life or death. Mm -hmm. With me? Okay. And so I, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page, and I think we are, that you're still able to consider what's going on in his mind, even if it doesn't meet the definition of insanity. Of insanity. Does exactly. that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So, yes, of course. Tell me why. Because at the end of, um, so, <laughs> the word for insanity itself, that word itself is, to me, boggling, because it, I can be insane right now, but you wouldn't know. True, you, know? you don't seem insane. Exactly. So, I mean, at the end of the day, again, it's all about the facts that is presented. Whether, I just, I, I don't know how to actually get it out. I just need to hear. Okay. I need to hear from the goat's mouth, as they say. Right, I got it. You're in healthcare, correct? That's correct. You are a COVID swabber. That is correct. Have the last, like, 18 months been miserable? No. I uh, have many follow-up questions for another time. Um, the questions we asked about some, or I asked, and the state and the judge asked about somebody being guilty for first-degree murder and death being automatic for you, and you said no. Would that change if the victim was a law enforcement officer? So follow me. Some people say if you kill a police officer, then you are deserving of the death penalty without any other consideration. Is that you? No. Why not? Because... Um Everybody's human. Police officers, I mean, they just have a badge. You know, everybody should be put in the category as the exact same as a human being, not just because of their title. Okay. And as Mr. Buxman discussed, when, we, when we're in penalty phase and the state has to prove an aggravator before the defendant is eligible for the death penalty, mm -hmm. killing a law enforcement officer is an aggravator. Mm -hmm. That's why we talk about it. Gotcha. Some people, we already talked about it. Same line of questioning, if somebody has been previously convicted of another murder and is serving life in prison, mm -hmm. some people say for this murder, death is really the only appropriate penalty. How do you feel? And then I would start leaning towards the death penalty when that evidence do come into play. Okay. And you can, again, a prior conviction for murder mm -hmm. is an aggravator. Mm -hmm. And so it can certainly lean you towards the death penalty. The question is, hearing that alone without anything else, are you saying, you know, I'm really not going to be able to consider anything else if I hear about this prior murder conviction and life sentence for this second murder now, death is the only appropriate penalty. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, 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 that's not how I feel. Um, okay. Again, it, like you always uh, have you been saying, there's aggravators and mediators. I think that's what you were saying. Yep. Well, it, it all depends. You gotta outweigh each other. You okay. know, you just weigh all options, weigh all responses, all evidences, and then you make your conclusion. You know, things are stack up, things are decrease. It all depends on how the case goes. Okay. Well, let me talk to you about a couple things, legal points. Death is never required. We already discussed that. Yes, not in any case, not in the worst conceivable case you can imagine. If one juror votes for life, then the verdict will be life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mitigation, you're going to hear it a lot. It literally just means why one juror would choose life or not choose death. It doesn't have to be unanimous. It can be unique to each individual juror. You don't have to agree on it. Mm -hmm. And it can be even something seemingly small, like a smile between the defendant and a family member. Where for that juror, that juror says, I saw that and I assigned the weight of life to it. Right? So some of these aggravators are huge, right? Prior murder convictions law enforcement officer, that sort of thing. And mitigation could be something seemingly small, and a juror can still say, for me, in this case, I assign the weight of life to that, and I'm not voting for a death sentence. Make sense? Mm -hmm. With me? Yeah, I'm with you. You agree to that? Agree with that? Tell me what you're thinking, please. Ins and outs. Um, again, <laughs> I don't want to come in here with the mindset of this is what I think immediately, Understood. you know. Um, I mean, everybody has their own opinions, you know. Everybody has their own way of they, how they see life. You wasn't raised the same way I was, right? And, you know, so it all comes down to individual judgment.
And when that comes to the point, it, like I said, it points out to the, the, the ins and outs, the ways. Right, and I'm not saying, I'm not giving that example about the smile between the defendant and saying you have to find that mitigating. I'm saying that somebody could find that mitigating even in the face of huge aggravators and still vote for life. Does Absolutely. that make sense? Okay. Absolutely. In order for a just verdict to be returned in this case, all 12 jurors' individual moral assessments about whether Mr. Lloyd lives or dies have to be heard in this courtroom. Okay. That's your duty, your right, your individual moral assessment is heard in this court. Okay? So the four person, whoever selected to be the four person of the jury, writes down the verdict. But in the second part of the trial, in doing so, that four person is really just saying, I am writing down that this is reflective of all 12 individual moral assessments. Make sense? Understood. Sometimes things can get contentious. All people are deliberating. Strong opinions. People have differences of opinions. Mm -hmm. You would certainly not bully or back anybody to agree with you if they had a different opinion, right? That's correct. I would not. And you're not going to let anybody bully or back you if you've come up with your individual moral assessment. And that is correct. In fact, if you've reached a, an individual moral assessment that the verdict should be life and it's not being respected, you can say, hey, listen, we're done here. I've reached a verdict. Go ahead and write it down. Deputy, please get the judge. We're done. We can go home. Can you do that? Yes. I have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Other side need to approach? No, Your Honor. All right, sir. We're going to send you through to the final round of questioning, and it is the final round. Okay. We're taking your badge because we're changing your color to purple. Oh, right. My favorite color. We, we call folks by per, by color, so you're now you're listening for the purple group to return. Okay. I don't know when you're coming back. I don't have enough people to call you back yet. I suspect it'll be next week, but just in case, start calling tomorrow night. Okay. Um, and all you're listening for is purple dots return. If you hear nothing about purple, you don't have to come back yet. Okay. The day you come back, we're picking the jury and we're sequestering the jury, so you need to have packed and leave the suitcase in the car. In case you get picked, we'll go get it. If not, you won't need it. We're giving you a packet. It has a couple of things in it. Number one, it's got the slip of paper that tells you the phone number to call to determine when you're coming back. It has a jury sequestration packet that text, tells you about being a sequestered juror in more detail, gives you a list of things we suggest you bring with you. And lastly, we have a letter for your employer telling them that you have been called back to report again to jury duty. Any questions? None at all. Thank you so much for your patience today. You have a good day. You You're too. free to Thank go. Thank you. Appreciate it, boss. Juror in seat number 60. Grab him. What'd you give him? Oh, dear Lord. Okay. Give me one second. I'll be right with you. Did you give them the paper he's supposed to have? Oh, okay. No, I meant, did you give them, did you give the deputies the one with the correct name? Oh, okay. All right. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Okay. All right. I have a few questions for you. There aren't any right or wrong answers to this. The reason we're asking you these questions is we need to determine, and you need to determine, whether you can do your job as a juror in this type of case. So the only correct answer is the truth. Just be honest. All right. Let me start with you haven't heard anything about this case, correct? Okay, you need to move the mic a little closer to your, to your mouth. Okay, yeah. Uh, the mic is a mystery, honestly, as to when it works and when it doesn't. Um, do you have a position on the death penalty? Have you ever thought about it before we brought you in? 
Okay. And what, all right. What what were your thoughts? Have you ever talked about it with someone? Let's try that one. See if that one's better. A lot of the time. And what was the content of that conversation? Uh, issue. It depends. There's a lot of things that go into it. Okay. Let me go over in a little bit more detail for you. Uh, the death penalty in the state of Florida. As I told you, no, there's no automatic death penalty in this state. In order to even have a conversation about it, a jury has to have gone through a guilt phase and found someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of first degree murder, intentionally killing someone with no legal reason for doing so. For example, it wasn't self-defense. There's no legal reason to kill this person, and you did it on purpose, right? So the person's been found guilty. Now you're in a penalty phase. Are you someone who believes that having found, and this is the only information you have, having found someone guilty of first degree murder, you are always going to sentence that person to life. You're not even going to consider death. Consider death. Consider all the options. All right. On the flip side of that, are you someone to, who believes that if you found someone guilty of first degree murder, that person needs to die? You're going to, you're going to vote for death every time. So if I add to that fact you found someone guilty of first degree murder of a police officer, does that change your answer? No. And if I find, if I add to that the person has been previously convicted of a murder, does that change your answer? No. As I told you, again, to even get to a penalty phase, you have to have made the decision that someone is guilty of first-degree murder. In the penalty phase, you have to listen to the state's aggravators. They're going to present evidence of that. Defense is going to present evidence of mitigators. You have to listen with an open mind. An open mind does not mean I'm sitting there listening until we get to the end so I can vote the way I was going to vote anyway. It means you're listening, you're absorbing the information, you're processing it. You're going to go in the jury room, weigh all these aggravators and mitigators. Can you go through that process with an open mind? Mm, yes, I don't think I'm in a situation with an open mind. Okay. And if that process led you to believe that um, death was the appropriate sentence, could you vote for that? Yes. If it led you to believe life without parole was the appropriate sentence, could you vote for that? Yes. I told you that Mr. Lloyd has raised the defense of insanity. That would occur in the guilt phase when you're trying to decide whether or not he's guilty, all right? If at the end of that, and the burden's on the defense to prove that one, state puts on their evidence, defense puts on their evidence, it's the end of the guilt phase and you're thinking, you know, they convinced me. I think he was insane at the time. Could you return a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity? Yes. And lastly, as I told you, he's been previously convicted of the murder of Miss Dixon and her unborn child. She was pregnant at the time. Can you put that out of your mind in making a decision about guilt? Yes, this is a separate case, yes. All right. You can consider it in penalty, but you cannot consider it in guilt. Can you do that? Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions, but I believe the uh, attorneys do. Mr. Buxman, you may inquire. Thank you, Good afternoon, sir. I want to start with a couple questions on the insanity issue. That is something that's going to be addressed in the guilt phase of the trial, the portion of the trial to try to decide whether or not Mr. Lloyd committed the crime. Because the insanity defense brings with it some issues regarding that, I have a couple, a little more personal questions for you about that. Do you, either you or a close friend or a family member have any dealt with or experienced mental health issues? Um, I was in my for psychology and I was up leaving from the masters in social works. I mean, I had a lot of that. So you're oh, more than the average person. Oh, yeah. All right. Based on that experience and that interest, I would assume that you are, you believe that mental health issues are, in fact, real in society with some people. Oh, yeah. Okay. Would your additional knowledge and experience in that program, that psychology program. Would that, do you 
to, would, that, would that hinder your ability to listen to the evidence, or would it enhance your ability to listen to the evidence and come to a conclusion? I think it would enhance it because I understand it. Sure. Would you be able to hold off to making a final decision on insanity to all the evidence surrounding the mental health issues in this case, if there are mental health issues in this case, and if so, what the consequences of those issues would be to the defendant's actions? Yeah, uh, I'm until everything has been presented to make a decision. Okay. Moving, stepping on to a different area now. Where for these questions, let's assume the jury has found the defendant guilty of first degree murder. The jury has rejected the insanity defense. And we're now moving into a penalty phase or what the proper punishment should be for the first degree murder. The focus of these questions is really to see if you would be an open minded and be able to consider all of the different evidence that is presented to you. And that's kind of the crux of my questions here. Before we get there, though, you mentioned that you have had extensive discussions about the death penalty with friends, co workers, things like that. Were some of those discussions had during your, your educational background or your psychology courses or anything? Uh, I've had that discussion multiple times with family members and friends. If, let's assume you're, you're in school, you're told by your professor you got to write a paper on the death penalty. You got to choose pro, you got to choose con, and you got to explain why you chose that. Hmm. What position would you take? It's situational. It really does depend on a lot of factors. Okay. I mean, there's other extenuating circumstances. That it's situational per case. Can you elaborate a little bit? Um, yeah, my coworkers were always, like, there was always the two extremes, but I always found myself in the middle of a, every discussion about it um, because it's saying, well, what if this happened? Or what if that happened? Because that changes it. And then you change that point of view because new evidence came up. So I'm gathering from your answers, you're pretty much down the middle of the road. Some cases it may be appropriate depending on the evidence, some mm -hmm. cases it may not. Yep. Fair enough. Okay. The judge went through a long explanation of, a thorough explanation of the death penalty process. So I just have a few, if we're at the death penalty stage in this case, mm -hmm. the state will present evidence of and you heard that we had a discussion with the judge about one of those aggravating factors could be that the victim was a law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. And you've already said that just because the victim was a law enforcement officer, you wouldn't automatically vote death regardless of any of the other evidence, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that the fact that the victim is a law enforcement officer was proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt. That is something as an aggravator that you can give whatever weight you felt appropriate to it. Mm -hmm. Prior murder of the defendant's girlfriend could be considered an aggravating factor, and if proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you can give weight to that. Makes sense? Yeah. So, say we have the victim's a law enforcement officer, has a prior murder, and those aggravating factors are starting to move you towards the pendulum of the death penalty is the proper punishment. Can you hold off a final decision until you hear all the evidence of the mitigating factors? The mitigating factors meaning evidence of the defendant's background, character, things like that. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't make a decision until it's all presented. Okay, because who knows what that mitigation could do to your thought process. Yeah, exactly. All right. Would you be able to listen to and truly consider and mull over in your mind any and all mitigation evidence presented to you before making a final decision? Uh, I'd like to think so, yes. All right. If after going through that process, that waiting process, you felt deliberating with the other jurors, you're talking about it, you feel in your heart that life was the proper punishment in this case. Could you come back and vote for that? Yeah. Likewise, on the other side of the, the coin. If you felt, not in a hypothetical situation, but you in this situation, if you felt the death, the death penalty was the proper punishment, could you come back in this courtroom, or raise your hand and say, I vote that this person deserves to die for what he did? Yep. Is there anything in your background, your experiences, your belief system that may make you not a good juror for this type of a case? And you brought up your, the psychological um, experiences and the, the classwork that you've done. 
Anything else that you can think of? Mm, nothing I can think of, no. Okay, and not to imply that your psychological, uh, um, your educational background in psychology would make you unfair, just as a factor of your life and your belief system. Oh, right. Nothing else? No. Nope. All right. You, one last question. You also, I noticed, work as a security guard. Yes, sir. The fact that this case involves the murder of a law enforcement officer, would that, the fact that you work in a similar capacity as a security guard, would that affect your ability to bear an impartial juror in this case? Mm, I don't know if it's a choice of what career I'm going to. So, I mean, that's all I would be saying. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Buckman. Ms. Miller, you may inquire. Hello. I just want to make sure. You have a BA in psychology? Yes, ma'am. And currently in a master's program? Uh, one semester away from the social work program. Okay. Is that at UCF? Uh, yes, it was. You discussed with both the judge and Mr. Buxman having extensive conversations with friends and colleagues about the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Tell me about those conversations. Uh, they would always go in with, oh, well, if they've never said made that choice, then yes, they should be put to death. But I would say that there's situational things because there is, people do go crazy in situations. Block out, um, things like that. And that's why I bring up. Okay. Um, and I don't, I'm not trying to belabor the point. You guys have discussed it at length. But insanity has been raised as a defense mm -hmm. by Mr. Lloyd, right? And so myself and my colleagues are going to try to prove that he was insane at the time of this crime. If we're in the second part of this trial, right, that means you would have rejected that as a defense. Does that make sense? No. Mm -hmm. okay. So if somebody's not guilty by reason of insanity, he's not guilty. Yeah. Right? And that means we're not getting to the part where you decide what the sentence is mm -hmm. because he's not guilty. With me? And so some people say, you know, if it's not insanity, it's really not going to matter to me. And so when you talk about things that are going on in somebody's head, I just want to discuss that a little bit more, knowing that if we're talking about penalty, you've already rejected the defense of insanity. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, let me try again. So somebody can have mental health issues, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they may not rise to being a defense to the crime of murder, okay. right? Being a defense to the crime is a pretty high burden. Get it? Yeah. But there still may be mental health issues in play. Yep. Right? And so even if you found somebody guilty, so if you've rejected the defense of insanity, you could still consider mental health issues even if they didn't rise to meeting that narrow legal definition of insanity. Does that make sense? Yeah, we could. Yeah. Do you think you could do that? Yes. Okay. One of the other things um, that you may hear evidence of is the effects of racism, mm -hmm. right, on the defendant. And so when we talk about giving something meaningful consideration, it's not, oh, I heard it, and then I'm equally dismissing it. You know what I mean? It's, I'm hearing this, I'm internalizing it, and it could potentially sway me one way or another mm -hmm. as to what the appropriate penalty is. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you think you could give meaningful consideration to something like the defense experiencing the effects of racism? Yes. How come? Um, in the program, we studied uh, racism on how it affects, like the invisible backpack, um, gender inequality in the workplace and other places. So racism does play a factor in decision making. Even on somebody who kills a police officer with intent in a premeditated manner? Um, yeah, it's one of the factors in the situation. Okay. Um, death is never required, not in any case. Okay, and so the process, if we're in the second part of the trial, and it's a penalty phase, the state has to prove the existence of at least one aggravating factor, as they discussed, right? Is that aggravator su sufficient to warrant the death penalty? Does the aggravation outweigh the mitigation? And then the last question is, is death the appropriate penalty? And the answer never has to be yes to that last question. You could say yes, 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 and still vote no. I'm not imposing death. Make sense? Yep. 
If one juror decides that life should be the appropriate penalty, then life will be the penalty. Make sense? Yep. We're going to talk about mitigation a lot. It is a legal term that means I one juror would choose life or not choose death. It does not have to be unanimous. It can be unique to each individual juror, and it can be even something seemingly small, like a smile observed between the defendant and a family member. For that juror, that juror says, I saw that. I find life. I'm not voting, death. I'm not voting for death. OK? In order for a just verdict to be returned in this case, all 12 jurors' individual moral assessments about whether Mr. Lloyd lives or dies have to be heard in this courtroom. It would be a miscarriage of justice if one juror's individual moral assessment wasn't heard. Mm -hmm. That's your duty, your right, and your responsibility as a juror is to make sure your individual moral assessment is heard in this courtroom, mm -hmm. okay? Sometimes when people are deliberating, they can get contentious. Right? People, like if when you talk about your conversations, people have strong opinions about these things. You would not bully or badger anybody to agree with you, right? opinions and perspectives, and that's what makes us all unique. Yep. And that's what the law calls for, mm -hmm. right? And you're not going to allow anybody to bully or badger you to changing your individual moral assessment, right? No, definitely not. Um, I didn't think you were going to say yes to that. <laughs> reached an individual moral assessment and the, the verdict should be life and it's not being respected you have the right to say hey we're done here I've reached a verdict deputy please get the judge we can go home can you do that oh yeah may I have just a moment your honor excuse me I decide I need to approach no, no, all right sir we're gonna send you through to the final round of questioning we will be picking the jury that day. So a couple of things are gonna to happen today. First of all, if you could give that badge to the deputy, please. We're gonna change your color from yellow to purple. So I told you, we use the color to tell people when to come back. There's too many of you to call out numbers. So we're gonna give you a packet. It's got several things in it. It's got a slip of paper with the phone number that you need to call to find out when you're supposed to report back for the final round of questioning. You're listening for the purple group. If you hear nothing, you haven't been called back yet. Eventually you're gonna hear purple group return. Don't bother calling before tomorrow at five. Um, the earliest you would be back is Friday, but I strongly suspect it'll be next week that we call you back. The day you come back, we're picking the jury and sequestering the jury. So you need to have packed a suitcase. Just leave it in your car. If you get picked, we'll make arrangements to get it picked up. If not, just drive home with it. There's a sequestration packet in there that gives you more detail about being sequestered as a juror. It also gives you a list of things we suggest you bring with you. And lastly, there's a letter in there for your employer to let them know that you're being called back for one more day of jury duty. Should you be picked, we'll give you a different letter for your employer. Any questions? So I just call that number every day just to confirm I'm coming tomorrow after five. Okay. okay. And eventually you'll hear the purple groups being called back. I don't have enough jurors to call you back yet, so I can't tell you the date. Oh. Okay? Any other questions? No. Thank you so much. You have a good afternoon. All right. That was the last juror from panel number seven. We're switching to panel number eight. I can't hear a word you're saying. What? Maybe five sure. Five minutes. All right, we're back on the record on State versus Lloyd. Mr. Lloyd's present with his attorneys. The state attorney's office is present. All right, we're on panel eight. Juror in seat number three, please. One, two, three. Panel eight, we've got three, four, and eight. What? It's coming in at nine o'clock tomorrow. Sure. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Okay. 
We have a few questions for you. I'm going to start, and then the lawyers will probably have some questions for you. There aren't any right or wrong answers to these questions. Uh, we're asking you questions to determine whether or not you're able to do your job as a juror in this type of case. We all need to know it, including you. So the only correct answer is the honest answer. Just tell us the truth, and we'll be fine. Let me start with, you've heard something about this case. Is that correct? Just on the little news clips, though. OK, you got to move the mic closer to your mouth. Sorry. The what? News clips. The news? Yeah, because I don't All right, what do you remember seeing from news clips? Anything? OK. Did you form any opinion as to whether or not Mr. Lloyd is guilty based on what you saw? In these cases, def um, jurors have to be able to, in all criminal cases, jurors have to be able to presume the defendant is innocent unless and until the state proves they're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Can you do that in this case? All right. Do you have any position on the death penalty? Yes. You what? If, you, if it's warranted, you're for it? Okay, what do you mean by that? I'm really having trouble hearing you. Is, is that mic working? Is it on? Nope. No, that mic is not working. Is it on? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. <laughs> All right. All right, so tell me what you mean by if it's warranted. It's depending on what the person's doing. I mean, okay. He could shoot a child. That would be, in my opinion, that would be warranted. All right. He could eat anything. So, as I told you, there's no automatic death penalty in the state of Florida. We just, it doesn't exist, even for shooting a child. Mm -hmm. We have a process, all right? Well, you've got to convict me first. Mm -hmm. you gotta... Okay, well, that's what we're going to talk about. First, you have to convict someone of first-degree murder. And first-degree murder is intentionally killing someone mm -hmm. when you have no legal justification for doing it. It's not self-defense. You just intentionally killed someone. So if you convicted someone of first-degree murder, would you automatically vote for death? Would you be thinking, first-degree murder, I'm voting for death? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me add a fact to that. If, there, if it was first-degree murder of a law enforcement officer, would you th be thinking, I'm voting for death? No, I don't think I don't know. Okay. If you heard that the person had a prior conviction for murder, would you be thinking, I'm voting for death? Mm. No? Is that a no? Yeah. Well, sorry. You have to answer out loud. Remember what I told you? Is that I a no? Question again. I, I missed it. If someone had been convicted of another murder, they had a prior murder conviction, would that cause you to, without listening to anything else, just, I've convicted him of first degree murder, I'm voting for death? No. Mm -hmm. All right. You heard me describe what the process is. First, there's the conviction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And without that, nothing no. happens, right? <laughs> so now there's a penalty phase. State's going to put on aggravators. What they believe are the reasons that you should vote for death. Defense is going to put on mitigators, what they believe are the reasons you should vote for life without parole. Mm -hmm. You're required as a juror, in order to do your job and follow the law, you have to be able to keep an open mind about this, all right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, you can't be sitting there thinking, yeah, go ahead and talk, and then so I can get to the point where I can vote for what I was going to vote for anyway. You have to be actually listening to what's going on, processing it, mm -hmm. you know. Then you're going to go back in the jury room, you're going to weigh aggravators and mitigators, you're going to reach a verdict. Can you go through the process of the penalty phase and the weighing with an open mind? Yes, ma'am. And if that led you to believe that the appropriate sentence was life without parole, can you vote for that? Good. And if it led you to believe that death was the appropriate sentence, can you vote for that? Yes, ma'am. The insanity defense, as I told you, Mr. Lloyd has raised that. When you're in the first phase, in the guilt phase, you're trying to decide whether he's guilty or not. It's the defense's burden to raise and prove insanity. So let's say you're at the end of that phase of the trial. The state's put on all their evidence, defense has put on all their evidence, and they've convinced you he was insane at the time. If that was true, could you vote, could you return a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity? Yeah, I believe so. You'd listen? Could you vote not guilty by reason of insanity? 
Yes, I believe it's good. Good. Okay. And then my last question to you is, remember I told you you'd been convicted of the murder of Miss Dixon and her unborn child. She was pregnant at the time. Can you put that out of your mind when you're trying to decide whether he's guilty or not of this case? Sure. Yes, you, can't, you can consider it in penalty, but you can't consider it in guilt. Do you understand okay. that? Yes, All right, sir. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Uh, Mr. Williams, you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. When you came in as a prospective juror, they asked you to answer some questions in writing, mm -hmm. and then you turned them in. And there were a number of questions that were left blank on your... Well, I, I messed up when I was filling it out. <laughs> I was on the okay. computer. Okay. So, um, are you currently employed? Uh, disability. Disability. Okay. So, like, is that sort of retired? Are you, would you consider yourself yeah. retired? <laughs> they, they retired me. They considered me no longer employable. Okay. Could you repeat your answer for yeah. her, please? They considered me no longer employable. So... Okay. Um, how long have you lived in Orange County? About three years. All right. And where'd you live before that? In Georgia. Okay. Bless you. Valdosta, Georgia. Valdosta, Georgia. All right. Thank you, sir. So you previously, you, you did, you were able to answer one question. That is that you were on a jury before? Oh, that was... That's been a long time ago. Yeah, I was on a jury before, but it's been years ago. Like more than 10 years ago? Probably, yeah. Okay. Do you remember if, that, if the case was criminal or civil? It was a divorce. It was a divorce. Okay. Um, did you actually deliberate and reach a decision? Yes, yes, I did. Don't tell me what it was. Were you the poor person? No. What did you think about going through that process as a juror? Yeah, it was okay to me. I mean, I'm, they did the evidence. We went and talked about it and said what we were going to say or made the verdict. Okay. Anything about that that makes you want to be a juror in this case or not want to be a juror? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think? Could you share, share your thoughts with me or us about being a juror in this case where murder is the charge and Have to do your duty and do your what you're supposed to do. Can I ask you to speak up because I can oh, see you? I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you, yeah. talk really loud, okay. you have to do your meet your responsibilities. Okay, there you go. So you view it as your responsibility to serve? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. So do you have you or someone close to you ever dealt with mental illness? No, sir. Um, there are those in our community who think that mental illness is not a real thing mm -hmm. and that it's made up as an excuse. Do you feel that way? No. Right? Tell me about that. What, what do you think about mental illness? Well, it exists. <laughs> you it you think it's real? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. And if it were proven to you by the defense, given that belief that Mr. Lloyd was insane this crime, could you find him not guilty by reason of insanity? I could. Keep that voice up. Okay. <laughs> I could. All right. So I heard you tell the judge at least three times with different questions that the death penalty would not be an automatic sentence for you if Mr. Lloyd were found guilty of this crime. Mm, yes. Can you tell me why it wouldn't be automatic in any one of those scenarios that she posed to you? And these are not easy questions. So mm -hmm. you need to take a moment, take all the time. Well, maybe because it had to prove to me, I call it malice. You call it malice? Malice. Okay. Malice, murder, malice, whatever. You have to prove him guilty first, and then you have to prove the, I guess the malice be the right word? The, the aggravators? Yeah, aggravated. Okay. Sorry. Is that the word you were looking for? Mm -hmm. Right? You're right. For, for the death penalty to be an option under Florida law, mm -hmm. if Mr. Lloyd were convicted of first-degree murder, we would have to prove at least one aggravator beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. Do you remember what other evidence you would hear beyond aggravators that the judge was uh, talking about? 
the defense side. Mediator. Mediator. Mitigator. That's right. And that would be anything in Mr. Lloyd's background or life experiences that they would argue to you. There are reasons why life without the possibility of parole would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. the, yes. the, I'm sorry? I said yes. <laughs> the key part to the process that was described to you is a willingness to consider everything before making the final decision. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Um, so my question is, if, if you heard evidence that you used the word, word heinous a long time ago, you mm -hmm. remember using that word? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yeah. Um, if, if you heard evidence that not only was a law enforcement officer murdered in this case, <clears throat> but that um, the murder occurred when she was on the ground and defenseless, and uh, the, she was shot from close range, was intentional, like, you know, you with me? Mm -hmm. and, you, and the judge told you that being a law enforcement officer was an aggravating factor under Florida law. She kind of alluded to that when she said you would consider it in the sentencing phase, but not in the case. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes, sir. Even if you found that situation to be aggravating, could you still listen to the mitigating circumstances before making a decision? Yes. Right. Um, if the defense were to present evidence to you that Mr. Lloyd had suffered the effects of racism when he was throughout his life, uh, could you give that meaningful consideration? Yes. You would decide how much weight to give it or how important it is, but you would be able to consider it. Yes, sir. Or if, if it were proven to you that he had had a difficult upbringing in his life, could you consider that? I could. Do you have any concerns about your ability to fairly and impartially go through this process as we've we described it? Yes, sir. Is there anything in your life or background experiences that you think we should know about you, given that we're trying to select the most fair and impartial jury possible? I don't think so. No, sir. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Honor. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Hello. Whoops. It's been a long day. I apologize for asking you some personal questions. Okay. When the judge was speaking to you last week, I believe you discussed having neck pain. Yeah, it's vertebrae. Okay. And you have to take medication for that? I'm sorry, I thought you no. told... No. Did you tell the judge you had to take meds last week or did I miss here? Okay, no, but I did, no. Okay, just you have neck pain and that occasionally you would need to take breaks? Uh, they give me a, a topical cream that you put in for uh, what they call it, um, inflammation. Okay, and does that help? Yeah, it does. Otherwise, are you in pain? Not a lot. It just depends on what I do, which I've learned not to do to make it. <laughs> right. You're like, I'm not going to do this thing that exacerbates the pain? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, is it something that would affect you sitting as a juror in this case? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Do you think you would experience pain sitting in that chair for long mm -hmm. periods of time? I'll get up and move around a little bit. Okay. You discussed with the judge, too, today mm -hmm. that if someone murdered a child, that for you, death would be the only appropriate penalty in that circumstance. Not necessarily. Well, what, do you recall having the conversation with the judge uh, about... I said that would be a heinous crime to me. Sure. I think everybody would agree with that. When you talk about the murder of a child, would you consider the murder of an unborn child, right? So a pregnant woman yes. gets murdered. Yes, ma'am. Would you consider that in the same circumstances as you discussed the murder of a child? Yes. Okay. And so I want to make sure we're on the same page. I don't, I'm not trying to belabor the point, okay? Right. This trial is really broken up into two different parts. The first part is where the state has to prove Mr. Lloyd guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, or we have to prove him not guilty by reason of insanity. With me? Yes, ma'am. The second part of the trial may never happen. It's only if he's found guilty of first-degree murder 
do we decide what the penalty is, right? That makes sense. Yes, ma'am. And so I just want to make sure, again, so we're on the same page. Murder in Florida is defined as the intentional premeditated killing of an innocent victim. That defendant thought about it, he meant to do it, and he did it. And if he was found guilty of murder, that jury that made that determination would have eliminated any defense available to him, right? Like self-defense, that's a defense to a crime. And so anything like that, the jury who found him guilty would have said, no, nope, he committed the crime of the intentional premeditated murder of an innocent victim, and he didn't have any legal excuse, justification, or defense. With me? Yes, ma'am. Is death the only appropriate penalty for somebody who commits that kind of, that kind of crime? Excuse me. I don't think so, no. Why not? You have to do it case by case, or I know, to me. Sure. Each case is going to be different. Sure, and that's where we've talked a lot about what the law is and what the law is going to ask of you if mm -hmm. you are selected as a juror. Yes, ma'am. Right? Right now, you are a prospective juror. Okay. And the only oath you've taken is to tell the truth. Yes, ma'am. And so we're having these conversations if it were a month ago, right? We're just talking about the death penalty, what your feelings are before you knew you were involved in this case. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay. On top of it being the murder of an innocent victim, it's the murder of a law enforcement officer. In the scenario Mr. Williams just described. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Right? Execution style, standing on top of someone, all of those things. Is death the only appropriate penalty for you in those circumstances? <clears throat> no. Why not? There have to be a lot of other reasons why he did it than just shooting him. Okay, because he wanted to. Yeah, wanted to, or he could be insane, I don't know. Right, that's, um, could be insane. Right, that's what you said? Okay. Sure, and I'm glad you brought that up. So insanity is a defense to the crime. Yes. Right, if you found somebody not guilty by reason of insanity, mm -hmm. you're finding that person not guilty. So we're not determining a penalty because the person's not guilty. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. And so knowing that this defendant who committed this heinous murder of a law enforcement officer wasn't insane, right? Because if we're talking about penalty, you would have eliminated that as a defense. Mm -hmm. Is death the only appropriate penalty? Mm -hmm. I think so, yes. Okay. And then the other thing I want to ask you about is, you have heard that Mr. Lloyd has been previously convicted of another murder of Sade Dixon, and she was pregnant. So it was the murder of Sade Dixon and her unborn child. Yes, ma'am. Right? And so the judge went to great detail in saying, if you found this person guilty, well, let's, let me try that again. Scratch that. You cannot use those facts in determining whether Mr. Lloyd is guilty of this crime. Absolutely. Right? Just because he was guilty of that doesn't mean he's necessarily guilty of this. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. But you can use it in deciding what the appropriate penalty is here. And so because Mr. Lloyd has been convicted of another murder of a person who was pregnant with an unborn child, does death now for this second murder become the only appropriate penalty for you? No. Explain that to me when you talked about unborn child being the same as child. You have to prove, um, you have to, prove to me why he did it or what the circumstances were. You can't just say death penalty. Right, that is the law, right, is that, and, and there are truly no right or wrong answers here, mm. right? We all, myself included, want to follow the judge's instructions, the rules, and the law. It's just about how you feel, right? Mm. And so some people say, listen, I hear you, but if I knew the defendant had been previously convicted of the murder of a pregnant mm. woman, and he committed another murder, then death becomes the only appropriate penalty. We've been trying for that, so. Right, but it is, and, and I don't want you to think it's not going to come up. It's going to come up if we get to the second part of this trial. And so that's the question is, knowing that fact, is death the only appropriate penalty in the sec in the second murder? Objection, ask and answer. Sustained. You would probably not be surprised to learn that folks can have differing opinions on these sort of things. Right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> 12 people coming from different walks of life often feel very differently about things like the death penalty or whether somebody should live or die. 
Fair? Yes. Death is never required in any case, not in the worst conceivable case you can imagine. Okay? And if one juror thinks that life should be the penalty, then life will be the penalty. Does that make sense? In order for a just verdict to be returned, all 12 jurors' individual moral assessments have to be heard in this courtroom about whether Mr. Lloyd lives or dies. Okay? Yes, ma'am. You're not going to bully or badger anybody to agree with you. Nope. And you're not, you're not going to let anybody do that to you? No, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. I do have a motion. All right, let me see the attorneys at the bench. <laughs> 